becoming a better version of ourselves. Perfectionism is a very tough thing to pursue. It's built in failure. But renewal and getting better and doing things differently and thinking outside the box and gaining new perspectives, that is all growth. That's all doable and doable in the manner and in the process and in the degree that each one of us can do that. When we are conscious of making a decision that we would like to grow, and we are aware that growth requires tension and change, then we are open to the moments of different perspectives and new ways of thinking. And it does not stop at 10 years old or 20 years old or 90 years old. Every time and place in our life cycle is a time for us to reflect on where we're at, what we believe, and what new things do we need to consider. We embrace at the Unitarian Universalist Church, change and growth. We are fully engaged in an evolutionary process, a creative process in this universe. So while the cosmos may not care too much about my anxiety in the morning, the universe has allowed us as human beings to be thoughtful and reflective and so I do believe the universe does care because it's given us the opportunity to care and we are part of the universe. So if we're gonna be not just consumers of our planet, but creative co-creators and partners in the evolution of our planet, we need to be open to change and new insights. I I'm going to ask three members of our congregation to share their metanoia or epiphany experiences. We all could be sharing, but we're just going to have three today. So we have Rick Dykes, Nicole Evans, and Donna Janeski. And I'm going to ask Donna to share first. Well, <clears throat> Peter calls it metanoia, but I call it a whack on the side of the head. <laughs> I subscribe to the frying pan theory of life. Basically, it's a belief that the universe will whack you on the side of your head to get your attention. The loud, harder the whack, the more important it is that you pay attention. At the age of 40, I found myself the sole breadwinner raising two teenagers and had to plunge into my career full force. I accepted responsible leadership positions and quickly advanced to director of nursing, regional corporate nurse, senior clinical services director, and eventually vice president of clinical services with major corporations doing business in many states. I gave all my positions 110% never called in sick, arrived early, and stayed late. Now, school was never a cakewalk for my son. He had to work at keeping up his grades, and while I managed assistance with college tuition, he held Donna down a job to pay for all his living expenses. He skipped a few semesters. He had to repeat some classes. I thought he would just drop out of school altogether, only to find out, find out that he was still plugging along. Several years passed, and finally he announced that he was eligible to receive his bachelor's degree at the next commencement ceremony at UNF. Yes, he could have completed in a much shorter time if he had more resources and more support, but now the time had finally come, and I was oh so proud of him. I eagerly anticipated attending the uh, commencement ceremony to watch my firstborn walk across the stage as they called his name and handed him his long sought after diploma. The problem was 
my company scheduled a meeting at our headquarters in Baltimore on the same day as the graduation at UNF. I carefully planned and checked flights and determined that I could take the 430 flight and return home in time to drive to the graduation at the university about 45 minutes away. After all, wasn't I very organized and a true multitasker? I had the trip figured out to the minute and was confident that I could pull this off. I made it to the airport on time, boarded the plane on schedule, only to sit on the tarmac for an inordinately long time. A mechanical failure had occurred, and it had to be repaired before we could depart. My eyes were glued to my watch, and my stress level was rising out of control. After an agonizing wait, we finally departed. The plane touched down at the same time the ceremony was scheduled to start. And I was greeted by a torrential rainstorm that would slow traffic to a crawl. I got in my car and made my way through the storm, heart beating wildly with visions of what must be happening at that very moment. I finally found a parking place and ran to open the auditorium door where I was greeted by the recessional march being played. It was over. I found my son and saw the disappointment in his eyes when he learned that I had just arrived. This was my frying pan moment, and I relive it every time I realize that I will never have a real memory of the university president calling my son's name, watching him stride across the stage, shaking hands, and accepting his hard-won diploma. My frying pan whack was a lesson that I was not Wonder Woman <laughs> and capable of delivering all the goods to all the people all of the time. I learned that some things need to take priority. How I regret that I did not opt out of that corporate meeting and spend the day with my son, getting ready for the ceremony, watching him graduate, and joyously celebrating afterwards. Now, I have a saying written above my kitchen door. It says, and I quote, pay attention to what you love, and I do. Thank you, Donna. Rick? Good morning, y'all. Um, somebody got a yellow card and a red card. Lois, you got your cards ready? Um, you don't live into your 80th year without experiencing lots of epiphanies, lots of them. Some of them are, aha! I have found it. And some of them are, ah, hell. Um, when I was 10 years old, I was a very positive go-getter. Um, I had the world by the tail because I was 10 years old. And I had a family that loved me. And I had a sister I fought with. And it was just grand. It was the way it was supposed to be. And then. I had an epiphany. My parents got divorced. And when that happened, my life changed just dramatically. And my thought about being safe and being secure and having people around me who loved me and wouldn't hurt me, that changed too. Because if you've been through divorce, you know it's painful. And it's not pleasant. And it, it can make you completely change how you look at life. And so that's a bad, a bad, ah, oh, hell epiphany. But, you know, not all epiphanies are that way. I want to tell you about a couple of good ones, good epiphanies. Of course, the most recent great epiphany I had was when I walked into the Magic Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Twin Falls, Idaho, and knew I had found a spiritual rebirth. 
wonderful. The other thing I want to tell you about is the epiphany I had almost 60 years ago when I went to Idaho with my roommates and I met this cute little blue-eyed, blonde-haired farm girl. And one day we were sitting on an, a concrete abutment below Twin Falls, waterfalls that are no, long, no longer twins because they put a power plant on one side and stopped it from going. But anyway, we were sitting there and I stole a kiss from this girl. And that was my epiphany moment because I knew I was going to marry this girl and I'm still with her today, almost 60 years later. Thank you, Rick. Nicole? Um, I have a sister. Her name is Lisa. And she got married a long time ago. And uh, the three of us were peas in a pod. And we had so much fun. And then she got pregnant. Yay! And she had my nephew. And oh my God, I loved him so much. I couldn't believe I would do anything for him. I loved him. I mean, I loved my mom. I loved my sister. I loved my friends. But my nephew, oh my God, where did that come from? I love you. I would give my life for him. I mean, he's not even my kid. And so uh, a couple years later, Lisa gets pregnant again, and I was really upset um, and sad that the baby, there was no possible way that I could love the new baby as much, and I was really, really sad, and she had the baby, and I met the baby, and there was more. Thank you. Let's give all three a round of applause. We really love your sharing. Thank you so much. Um, you know, you, you think about that, what comes to you, and Nicole's thinking, I couldn't think any, there is, there is no more love there. That love tank has been completely given out, and yet when the new baby came, she had just that extra coming through. And, um, and, and I appreciate that sharing because, you know, when every one of us walks through the door and we think about, like, I look at, like, Donna has that on her mirror every day, right? And so she sees that every morning. It's a reminder of one moment in time that has changed her life. And if anybody knows Donna, although I kidded Donna a little bit about it, Donna never says no to anything <laughs> for the people she loves. And that is tremendous. And then when I thought of Rick talking about the, the moment, the sparks, the resilience of a 10-year-old whose life changed forever, but it changed him forever, became that person, that person that has been married 60 years, right? And the epiphany that he had, that it's, this is going all the way, and I love that. So thank you all. I might add that I think the epiphany experience that each one of them had, and that Len Shad gave to me, because that's how I was introduced to coming here at an event, and she invited us to a Lena weekend, um, is the epiphany of coming into this space and knowing it's the right place. Of course, Rick, you did it early on at another Unitarian Universalist church. And, and I find that where we're at here, if you're a new member, just the beautiful setting is, is a wonderful place to be. 
and then the welcoming environment. And then you have to get used to the fact that no one tells you what you should believe. That's a little disconcerting. And that everybody believes actually something quite different. And that can be disconcerting. So um, all of those are epiphany experiences for us. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, at another time, how we embrace those epiphany experiences here. And um, that is important for us because there's a lot of external realities that if we did not have an epiphany experience, we would not have moved on. And one brief example is I care. If we had said, I, we, we had a church member here um, who's since passed away, but went to the I care meetings, and, and her own personal belief was Wiccan, and she came after an I care celebration, and she said to me, well, she goes, you know, they did sing to Jesus, but she goes, but that's okay. And she goes, because we're all together. And, and I just loved it that she was able to get past her own personal viewpoint of particular spirituality and understand the epiphany experience that if we don't all work together, nothing will happen. That's the opposite of what I care tells us.